Okay, welcome everybody to Hot Topics, where today we're going to be talking about this particular topic. Who are the true saints? Are the true saints the people according to both the Catholic and Orthodox denominations, are the true saints people who are now in heaven, who, have, who were so super spiritual, the elite of the elite Christians down here on earth, are they the true saints as declared by both the Catholic and and Orthodox denominations. And if they are the true saints, are the Catholic and Orthodox denominations correct that we should pray to those saints? Where they are our patrons and take our prayers to Mary, to Jesus, to God? Are they the true saints? Or does the Bible actually declare who the true saints are? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and let's take a look at what the scripture says as to who the true saints are. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Starting in verse 2, the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, a church he had planted during his second missionary journey, Corinth, in the southern part of Greece, in the region of Achaia. And Paul starts out his letter to them in verse 2 by calling them the church of God which is at Corinth. And he is writing to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. The Apostle Paul called the Christians there in the church in Corinth, he called them saints. Now, for those of you who have been going through our Corinthian study during our weeknight Bible studies, you're very aware at all the problems <laughs> these Christians in that church were causing, right? They certainly were not the super spiritual elites. I mean, they were allowing Greek philosophy into the church. Uh, one man in the church was committing incest and the majority of the people in the church were ignoring it. There were those who were involved in sexual immorality. You had believers taking other believers in the church to court, suing each other in front of pagan judges. This church had major, major challenges. Yet Paul describes them, again in verse 2, as the church of God, people who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, and therefore they are saints by calling. In this context, sanctified in Christ Jesus means that they have been set apart. They have been chosen out of the kingdom of darkness and graciously brought into the kingdom of light, Christ's kingdom. They had been chosen, set apart, sanctified. They are other than they used to be. 
And Paul says, as a result, they were saints, or some of your versions may say, holy ones by calling. They used to be pagans. They used to be separated from God, outside the family of God, under the just judgment of God. They were sinners on a highway to hell. But because of God's mercy and grace towards them, He saved them. They were set apart. They were sanctified. They went from darkness to light. They were now children of God. Listen, saints by calling, calling into salvation. Again, these were not super spiritual Christians, right? They had been pagans, living like pagans before they had been saved. Even after they were saved, although their, listen, position was that they were in Christ and therefore they were declared saints holy ones because of their position in Christ. That was their position, but unfortunately their practice left a lot to be desired. And that's why Paul wrote this letter to them. To urge them, command them, instruct them to start living in practice according to the reality of their position in Christ. Make sense? Now, how is it that they became saints? Go to chapter 6. Starting in verse 9. Paul describes who they were and how they were before they had been graciously saved by the Lord. Verse 9, some of them were fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. And then Paul says to them in verse 11, such were some of you. Well, how is it they went from being those, those people, <laughs> that list, to now being saints in Christ? Well, it's all the work of God. You were washed, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You were sanctified, set apart, taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, and you were justified, declared holy, just, by the just judge. God made a legal declaration about them that they were righteous in his sight, not because of their righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. They were washed, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, set apart, sanctified, taken out of darkness into light, and God made a legal declaration about them. They were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Do you see it? So, who are the true saints? Super spiritual elite group of people who are now in heaven? to whom we can pray and they can be our patron saints and take our prayers to God? No. The Bible says the true saints are ready. Well, again, look at, look at verse 11. Those who've been washed, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Those who've been sanctified, set apart, 
brought into God's kingdom, those who have been justified, declared not guilty and righteous in God's sight because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to their account. Those are the true saints. The true saints are all those who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Just like the Corinthians. Well, okay, Andrew, if that's the case, which it is, then where did the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church come up with this idea of saints in heaven, the super spiritual elite, we pray to them, they take our prayer, where they, where they come up with this? Well, actually, this idea of praying to saints was not part of, obviously, the early church. It, it, it started to take hold somewhere around the 300s A.D., during the reign of Constantine. Constantine, a very famous Roman emperor. Now, I want you to think about how things were structured back then in the Roman Empire. Think of a pyramid. Who sat at the top of the pyramid in the Roman Empire? The emperor. Who was the next close or the, the closest to their, you know, to the top after the emperor? You would have his officials, let's say. Government officials. Not all of them. Some were closer. Some were a little bit lower on the pyramid, right? And then you would have the common people, right? And then you would have at the bottom of the pyramid, the slaves. So you had this hierarchical structure. Now here is the question. Let's say you're at the bottom of the pyramid. Or even a little bit higher common person. How is it that you can get to the emperor to talk to him, to seek favor from him? If you're a slave at the bottom of the pyramid, you can't go to the emperor, right? If you're part of the general population, you don't have immediate access to the emperor, right? You needed, listen, a patron or patrons. Somebody who could go to the emperor for you. And so maybe you had a friend who was working in the Roman government. You would go to that friend and look to him as a patron and say, hey, can you kind of get me an audience with the emperor? Now, depending on how high of the, you know, how high on the pyramid that friend was, maybe that, that friend could go directly to the emperor. That's great. Or maybe he wasn't quite close enough and he needed a patron. And maybe that patron needed a patron. And eventually, hopefully, if you had enough patrons you could get your request to the emperor. Do you understand the point? That same mentality crept into the church back then, around the 300s. I mean, think about it. If I, as a common person, in the Roman Empire cannot have direct access to the Roman Emperor, well then, even as a Christian, how could I have direct access to, the, to God? There's no way. So what do I do? Oh, the Catholic Church said, you need patron saints.
And they defined the saints, as I said earlier, this group of super spiritual people who lived exemplarily Christian lives down here on earth, many of whom would have been martyred for their faith. They died, and suddenly the Catholic Church took on the role of being the authority to, to declare certain people to be saints. And they started declaring enough people over the years to, as saints that eventually you had actually a specific saint for pretty much every specific need. I talked about a couple of weeks ago during our Lord's Day service about St. Jude. St. Jude, according to the Catholic Church, is the patron saint of hopeless situations, hopeless causes. Well, you find yourself back in the Roman Empire in a hopeless situation, a hopeless, you're dealing with a hopeless cause. What do I do? I, thinking back, I can't go straight to God, just like, you know, I can't go straight to the emperor. I need some patrons to help me along the way. Well, that same mentality in the Roman Catholic Church was, okay, who's the patron saint of hopeless causes. Oh, St. Jude. So I will take my prayer request to St. Jude with the hope that St. Jude then can take my request to Jesus. Do you see the mentality? Well, guys, we know that is completely unbiblical, right? It's unbiblical for two reasons. Go to Revelation real quick. Chapter 21. Here's a picture of heaven. And we are told that in heaven, verse 3, God tabernacles, dwells with his people in heaven. They are his people. God himself is among them. Look at verse 4. Are there any tears in heaven crying? No. Is there any Death anymore in heaven? No, because there's no sin. How about mourning, crying? How about pain? Nope. Let me ask you a question. If one of your loved ones who has passed and is now at home with the Lord in heaven, if any of your loved ones had the ability to look down from heaven upon you right now, as we're going through this, what, almost two years now of COVID, many of you have experienced health issues, many of you have experienced financial issues, many of you have experienced the loss of loved ones. If your loved ones could look down from heaven right now upon you, chances are they would be crying as they saw you going through this tough thing called life, right? But wait a second, doesn't the Bible say there's no crying in heaven? Which tells you what? Those in heaven their focus is not on us down here on earth. Who is their focus on? The Lord Jesus Christ. They're worshiping their Lord and Savior. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, they're all there worshiping the Lord and somebody goes, oh, time out. I, I have to stop because, um, you know, Rory, my, my, you know, my granddaughter's on earth and, and she's calling me because she's got a prayer request that I need to take. To what? 
That's insane. The people in heaven right now are worshiping, praising their Lord. They are not looking down on us. They are not feeling pain and sadness as they watch us go through this tough thing called life. Does that make sense? So when you think about this idea of patron saints, theologically, that is so wrong. I mean, imagine if St. Jude actually was the patron saint of hopeless causes. Can you imagine how many people have contacted St. Jude over the, the, the years with all their hopeless causes? I mean, if St. Jude could actually hear those prayers, he would be crying, right? In fact, a famous actor uh, and singer back years back, Danny Thomas, many of you remember him. I think I mentioned this in one of my sermons recently. Um, he actually was the founder of a, of a phenomenal children's hospital called the St. Jude Children's Hospital, a children's hospital for children with, you know, medically speaking, hopeless situations. And a ton of money's been raised, a ton of research has been done, and a lot of good has been done. But actually, the root of, of the founding of that hospital is Danny Thomas, you know, when he was still alive, told the story that he was looking to use his fame and his fortune for something good, which is a good thing. So he, I guess he was in Detroit, Michigan, and walked into a Catholic church, and apparently, according to him, he prayed to St. Jude and said, what do I do? And that was the genesis of the founding of St. Jude Children's Hospital, which again is, you know, nice cause, very good cause, but theologically, um, Danny Thomas did not speak to St. Jude, right? And Catholic people and Orthodox people, when they pray to who they call saints and who they define as saints as being the super spiritual elite, those, those people in heaven don't hear their prayers. They're worshiping Christ. And a little side note, you don't want your loved ones in heaven to hear your prayers, do you? <laughs> they don't want to, you don't want them hearing your, 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 seeing your pain and your suffering. You want them focusing on their Lord. But there's another problem, big time theological problem, when it comes to this idea of praying to saints in heaven you do realize that when we die and go home to glory, we will still be finite created beings, right? The only infinite, most holy being is God. And the only one who is omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, fully present everywhere, and omnipotent, all-powerful. The only being who has the attributes of the omnis is God. We, when we come into glory, we will not have a sin nature, praise God. We will, after our Lord returns and ushers in the eternal state, we will have glorified bodies united to our already glorified souls. We will be in glory. But we will not be infinite as God is infinite. We will not have the attribute of omniscience or omnipresence, right? Or omnipotence which means for those who, let's say, pray to St. Jude, let's say Christine up in Delray Beach, Florida, 
this morning was praying to St. Jude. Let's say Dayon in Skopje, Macedonia at the same time was praying to St. Jude. Let's say Michelle up in New Hampshire this morning was praying to St. Jude. Let's say Allen in Louisville, Kentucky at the same time was praying to St. Jude. What's the theological problem with that? Besides the fact that people in heaven cannot hear our prayers. What's the other theological problem with that? St. Jude's not omnipresent. He, he can't at the same time hear Michelle in New Hampshire Dayon in Skopje, Macedonia, Allen in Louisville, Kentucky, and, and, and Christine in Delray Beach, Florida. No! He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. Does that make sense? So everything about this idea of saints as defined by the Catholic and Orthodox Church as being the super spiritual elite who become our patrons, taking our requests to the king, everything about how they define saints and everything theologically about what they say saints can do, it's all wrong. Christian, scripture makes it very clear. Who are the true saints? Christian, you are because you have been washed, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You have been sanctified, set apart, taken out of the kingdom of darkness, and graciously brought into the kingdom of light. And God has declared you justified, not guilty, because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to your account. Your position right now, Christian, is this. You are in Christ, and therefore you are a saint, holy one by calling. In the Greek, saint, hagios, means holy, set apart. In the Latin, sanctus. But biblically speaking, all born again believers are saints. That is what God has declared about you, Christian. Because of the perfect, holy righteousness of Christ imputed credited to your account. So that's your position, right? And that will be your actual reality when you get home in glory. But in between the time of your justification, when God legally declares you holy, between the time of your justification and your glorification is that process of sanctification, where the Holy Spirit inside of you is making you more holy in practice, right? That's why, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 as I conclude. First Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 14, Peter writing to Christians saying, As obedient children, notice the word obedient, children who have been sanctified, taken out of the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of light. We're now children of God. What are we supposed to do? Obey God. Do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you into salvation and the Holy One who has made you and declared you holy because you're in Christ, between this time of 
your justification, your glorification, Christian, more and more, you are to be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, God says, because I am holy. Guess what, gang? You are already holy, a saint. You're justified. That is a past declaration. Christian, you will be fully holy. Not as God is, but you will be in glory one day. That is your future guarantee. But in the meantime, while you're here on earth, each and every day, you are to pursue holiness. Where more and more in the power of the Spirit, you're saying no to your sin nature and yes to the Holy Spirit, living for the glory of your triune God, who, by the way, in His grace, set you apart and took you from the kingdom of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of light. Christian, dear saint, Let's live our lives to bring glory to the one who graciously saved us. Amen.